everybody, and welcome to my show. My name is Jason DaCosta, and this is Consistent Preterism. That was... I don't even know who that was. See, what I do in the beginning for the intro music is I find a radio station that has a decent tune. And I'm a fan of all different types of music, so it really doesn't matter. But I put that tune on, I blast it, I let you guys enjoy it for 10 seconds, and then I just kind of slowly taper it off. Because this is... A high-tech production. <clears throat> Pardon me. I wanted to talk a little bit today about uh, a couple of things. First and foremost, I found out the identity of Daniel Chicken Chit Shaolin, everybody. Yes, that's right. Daniel Chicken Chit Shaolin, right? And on YouTube, I have to call him Chit, C-H-I-T, because YouTube's been effing with me big time lately. It doesn't allow any of my comments to post. It doesn't allow people to post on my uh, comments and those be seen. It, it censors random posts from people or random comments and doesn't allow them to appear to the public. It's very, very bizarre. Um, I've commented back to this idiot probably 50 times and it doesn't post it. So it's very frustrating um, that YouTube acts in this manner. But um, I did find out the identity of Chicken Shit Shaolin and it's actually a guy named Daniel Sitterly. He's a he's in the UK. Um, he looks like uh, like a drugged up version of uh, Chris. Is it Chris Hemsworth or something? He's 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 a loser. All right. And a few people actually told me that this is his identity, and that th- that he is the uh, self proclaimed savior of Christianity in certain Facebook groups. And uh, they told me that he acts just like he's acting on the channel. Uh, you know, a lot of emojis, a lot of like smiley faces like he he thinks he's really smart um but of course he's the poster boy for the dunning kruger effect which says that uh those who think they're the smartest are usually the stupidest um and that's exactly what he is so um we found out the identity i have pictures of him probably going to make some nice memes of him but in the meantime i wanted to discuss one of his core arguments and just show you how ridiculously stupid it is um, this man's argument against IO is, is well, he's got a lot of arguments, a lot of the basic uh, elementary level arguments like, uh, you know, singular seed and the great multitude of revelation is not the same as the 12 tribes and, you know, the, the same nonsense that we've beaten into a pulp many, many times over. Um, he thinks is new and fresh and exciting and he's not doing anything, but he thinks he is. But one that really struck me as comical is his understanding of Romans 4, verse 1, which uh, says, What did our father Abraham find according to the flesh? Uh, For, let's see, let me just go read it real quick for you guys. That way we can get the right view here. It says, What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. Okay, so this man's view is that Abraham and his according to the flesh in that portion actually means general works of the flesh. That's right, folks. So Paul is asking here in Romans 4.1, according to this bozo, what did Abraham, our father, find according to his general works of the flesh? Okay, general works of the flesh. So, I mean, it's kind of difficult to even imagine what that might mean or what that might look like. Um, But I would assume, because it's an argument that other wannabes have made over the years, um, I would assume that it looks something like, well, Abraham tried through the power of his fleshly meat suit, right, the body, this fleshly thing with blood and bones and guts in it, through that body, um, he tried to find favor, I guess. Like, what did he find according to his fleshly meat suit of a body, right? This this meat suit that we exist in. What did he find according to that meat suit? He didn't find anything, right? What did he find according to uh, his pride? He didn't find anything. What did he find according to his 
uh, stubbornness. He didn't find anything. What did he find according to his intelligence? He didn't find anything, right? This is the argument that these cats would make about what according to the flesh actually means, right? They're taking a very literal approach to the word flesh there, and they're ignoring all the contextual details that have been laid before that to be able to understand what that actually means. Um, so again, his argument and many wannabes' arguments is that the according to the flesh is simply Paul asking, what did Abraham find according to his general works of the law, right? Um, because remember, Paul asks after that question, he says, for, or he says, for if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. So again, this man is looking at the works that Paul mentions there as general works of the flesh, right? Being a good boy, uh, maybe obeying your parents, you know, just being a nice person, general works of the flesh, right? But of course, anybody who has a shred of biblical knowledge and, and understands what the New Testament is about and understands the curse of Israel's law, understands that Paul is not talking about some random general works of the flesh uh, that this bozo nor anyone else can even define. Right? Paul is talking about what, folks? What is Paul talking about when he says, for if Abraham was justified by works, he has nothing to boast about, right? Paul is talking about the law, okay? The law. Just like Paul talks about in all of his other letters. He's talking about the law, the requirements of the law, and specifically circumcision, which was the tippity top, the main requirement the seal of the covenant was the circumcision. So Paul is very, very clearly asking, what did Abraham find according to the flesh, according to his circumcision? What did Abraham find or what favor did Abraham gain by getting circumcised, by becoming circumcised? And his whole point is that he didn't gain anything because his faith came before his circumcision, right? I mean, this is basic elementary level stuff here that Christians for centuries have butchered into meaning some general works of the flesh, right? I mean, just a, a, a pure uh, butchering of the text, a pure butchering of everything that the story is about, right? What I'm going to do is I'm going to look back quickly at Romans 1, 2, and 3, just to set this in its proper context for you so that you can understand just how stupid this cat is, all right? When we look at Romans 1, 2, 3, 4, all of them, all the chapters, the whole letter, but specifically the beginning, we can see there's some pretty clear indicators as to who Paul is actually speaking of here, right? Specifically, look at Romans chapter 1, because remember, I like to do this. I like to go back and kind of catch Romans 4 in its flowing context, because remember, there is no chapter breaks or there were no chapter breaks, right? That's, an in, that's a thing that's been inserted into the text, right? This was a letter, okay? And it's one of Paul's letters that uh, I believe, I believe they believe that it's one of his legit seven, right? Like the Myth Vision guys. Although I, I'm not really sure, it may or may not be, but whatever, whether it was forged, whatever the case, it doesn't matter. We're looking at what Paul is saying here, okay? And so look at verse 18. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against unrighteousness and ungodliness of men who suppress the truth, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were they thankful but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness, uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts, to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So what is Paul doing there in Romans 1 as he's introducing this whole concept of these individuals 
breaking their relationship with their God, right? Well, I'll tell you what he's doing. It's very clear. It's very powerful. And it smacks and splatters little bugs like Daniel chicken shit shitterly. Okay? It smacks them down into the dirt where they belong. Paul is saying, Paul is clearly speaking of an individual party or a group or an exclusive group of individuals that knew God, right? He says it flat out. They knew God. But although they knew God, they did not glorify God but instead became darkened and their foolish hearts were darkened and God gave them up to vile passions, right? It also says that he showed himself to them. He manifested himself to them. Now, folks, listen to me, okay? Just listen to me. If anyone tells you that pagans, right, the outer world knew God or had a relationship with God or that God revealed himself or manifested himself to pagan nations... And that God had a relationship with them. They are boneheads. All right. I just I have to make that clear. If anyone tells you that, then they you, you need to go away from them immediately because they do not understand the story. Right. Because if you look at the Old Testament, the only thing that we can take from the Old Testament when it comes to that subject is that God only knew Israel. He only revealed himself to Israel. He didn't even know the other nations, says Psalm 147, right? He didn't even know the other nations, okay? Deuteronomy, as Moses is outlining this whole covenant for the Israelites, he says, what great nation has the Lord our God? In other words, no great nation did. He goes on, he says, he did marvelous things before your eyes, right? That's that whole, he manifested himself to you. He showed himself to you. He revealed himself to you, right? And, and of course, the whole point of this with Moses back in the start is that these Israelites, the covenant people, were given such a responsibility and such a divine um, blessing by being able to be, you know, to be in relationship with this individual God, Yahweh, that they needed to really not screw up, right? He's telling them, he's saying, you need to take this to heart. You need to write it on your heart. Right? The law being written on your hearts, it all ties together. But he's telling them, take it to heart and cherish this, because this is very important. And if you notice, he says, if you don't do this, if you don't abide by the law and be careful to observe everything written in it, you're going to be cursed. Right? How many times do we see the curse language used in Deuteronomy when Moses is outlining what the law was? It was either going to be a blessing or a curse to the people. And of course, flash forward to the end of the story, we see Paul's entire focus in all of his letters is about the law. It's about the curse of the law. Cursed is everyone who does not do all things written in the book of law. He has wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, he told the Colossians. Right? He has nailed the law to the cross, he told the Ephesians. Right? The whole point of Paul, he's the end of the law to those who believe. He was born into the law to redeem those under the law. The whole point of all Paul's epistles is the law, folks. Not some general works of the flesh like bonehead shitterly would have you believe. But the actual law. The only law in this story, the law of Israel. Okay? And that's what we talk about. Things coming full circle. Letting the story dictate the story. Stuff like that. Which shitterly and other doofuses do not do. But Romans 1, Paul drops the bomb on Shitterly and the gang. And he says, although they knew God, they didn't glorify God, but instead they became darkened and they worshipped four-footed cows and creatures and beasts. Well, this is precisely Israel. This is exactly Israel. This is everything that we see in the Old Testament about Israel, folks. This is what it is. And Paul is just going through the rundown of Israel's history. He's outlining almost picture perfectly, word for word, everything that we see that took place with Israel in their history. See, guys like Shitterly don't understand that. In order for um, someone to have known God and then fallen away from that, they would have to have been in covenant because only the covenant people were said to have known this God. Right? You alone have I known of all the nations of the earth. Right? This is all over the Old Testament. Okay? So, that's point number one. 
And what's interesting is if you compare Romans 1 to places like Acts chapter 7, we remember Acts 7 where Stephen is giving the discourse in Jerusalem, I believe it is. And what does Stephen say there? He says he goes through the children of Israel's history, right? This is, this is, not a, this is no surprise to anybody, right? It's not like Stephen's being mysterious about it. He literally says that, okay, I'm about to talk about Israel's entire history. Go read it, Acts chapter 7, okay? And notice what Stephen says about the children of Israel. As he's going through the history and talking about their idolatry and what happened with them and Moses and Abraham and everything, what does he say? He says, I'm paraphrasing here because I'm running over dead squirrels on the road, but he says, and they were darkened and God gave them up to their vile passions and stuff like that. But the, the language to really take notice of is God giving them up to their vile passions. This is precisely what Paul says in Romans 1, people. Right? Here it is. They changed the glory of God to corruptible man and birds and four-footing beasts and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up to their uncleanness in the lust of their hearts, yada, yada, yada. For this reason, God gave them up to their vile passions. Even their women exchanged the natural use. Even their women, right? Their women. Who's there? You can see the contextuality if that's even a word, of what Paul's doing here. Paul is not speaking of every human being on planet Earth. He's speaking of an exclusive, unique group of individuals. And that was the covenant people. Even their women gave it up, right? But God gave them up to their uncleanness. And this is the whole point of Israel. This is the entire tale, okay? This is everything that we see taking place in their histories. All right? And he goes on in, in uh, Romans 1, he says, they become violent, proud, boasters, backbiters, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful. But look at this, he says, who, knowing the righteous judgments of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but approve of those who practice them. So notice there's two parties in view there. There's the individual party that Paul's talking about, those in focus, and then there's other people outside of that, right? So this is not the whole world. Paul is comparing the ones who knew the righteous judgments of God, but yet still decided they were going to do it anyway, right? And did, did things that the outsiders would do, right? Of course, because this is all about Israel. So what I just did in Romans 1 is I backhanded shitterly into oblivion, okay? Because Shitterly's understanding of the text is a basic, fundamental, elementary, toddler-level, Christian, wannabe, Israelite. That's all it is. With a little twist because he adds smiley face emojis and LOLs and makes it seem as though he's defeating people in debate. When he's not, okay? He's not. All he's doing is what everybody else does. He's ignoring the story. He's ignoring the foundational details. He's ignoring the Old Testament, like the plague. Um... And he just doesn't know what he's talking about, right? That's just as simple as it gets. But let's move on to Romans 2 so we can continue to catch this in its flowing context as we come upon Romans 4, verse 1. So in Romans chapter 2, Paul says, Therefore you're inexcusable, blah, blah, blah. You know that God's goodness and whatever is meant to lead you to repentance, blah, blah, blah. You're treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath at the righteous re revelation of Jesus Christ, blah, blah, blah. Now, of course, we know this can't extend beyond the end because when was the day of wrath? When was the final coming of the Lord? When was that fiery and flaming judgment? It was in that generation and it occurred at the destruction of Jerusalem, which, of course, solidifies my point even further because if this was a universal judgment, it wouldn't have happened at the destruction of Jerusalem. It would have happened at the end of the universe. <laughs> but it didn't, right? It happened at the destruction of Jerusalem, of course, because it was contextually linked to the law and the old covenant. Pretty simple stuff. And he goes on. Let's see. He goes on down, uh, scroll, scroll. For as many as sinned without the law will also perish with the law, and as many have sinned with the law will perish, will be judged by the law. Again, what's Paul doing? He's simply making the distinction between the Israelites who were sinning without the law and the Israelites who were sinning under the law, okay? That, that's the whole point. These Israelites who were scattered and living as pagans in fulfillment of what Moses said time and time again in Deuteronomy, these Israelites were dead in trespasses and sins. They were dead. They were, they were so far dead in trespasses and sins that it had piled up so far and so high 
that Paul's just like, listen, you're dead. <laughs> you're dead. Like he tells the, the Colossians, he says, you know, you were you're dead you were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh. That's an uncircumcised Israelite who should be circumcised, but who's living in the nations and not circumcised. That's what that is. How could someone trespass a law that they never had? Again, this goes back to Shitterly not knowing his Old Testament and not knowing that God only declared his laws to Jacob. Quote, God did not give his laws to any other nation. He did not give his judgments to any other nation, says the psalmist. Isn't that amazing how Paul in Romans 1 says that this group of people, although they knew the righteous judgments of God, they chose not to abide by them. Isn't it amazing how that contradicts the Old Testament if we take Shitterly's view that everybody's in view here with Paul, right? It totally contradicts. But you see, this is where I.O. comes in, whips out its Johnson and says, Daddy's home. Because the Old Testament clearly says that only Israel had the righteous judgments of God. Only Israel knew the judgments of God. Only Israel had the law. No one else did. So if these ones that Paul is speaking about in Romans 1, although they knew the righteous judgments of God, they chose not to do them, who do you think this is, folks? Who do you think? Is it everybody like UK, Chitterlin, Shitterlin? Would have you believe? Of course it's not. Of course it's not. So Paul goes on and he says this in verse 17. Now this is where I need you to pay attention because Paul in this letter, as well as all of his other letters, puts a very special emphasis on the law, right? The law. And of course, the predominant and most important aspect of that law, where the covenant was established in, was the flesh. It was in the flesh. It was in the wiener schnitzel, all right? It was in the wiener schnitzel. It was circumcision. So notice excuse me, what Paul does here as he starts talking about the law. Because remember, this is important to keep keep note of. Paul is not just writing to Jews in Rome, okay? If anyone tells you that, they're a bonehead. Paul is not just writing to Jews in Galatia, okay? Paul is writing to a mixed bag of the children of Israel. Jew, Gentile, slave, free, male, female, didn't matter if they were Christ's, it was because they were Abraham's descendants, aka the children of Israel, and they were heirs according to the promise. So this is very important to take notice of. You can understand what Paul is doing. He said he'd become all things to all men, that he would win them back. Right? The point is, is what Paul's doing is he's not he's not fighting against Jews for pagan inclusion, like this idiot would suggest. He's explaining to the Jewish elect, that being the children of Israel who are abiding by the law, he's explaining to them why they should accept their brethren, why they should accept their non, their, uh, non-law their non observant brethren, right? Why they should accept their uncircumcised brethren. And he has to do that in a way that they would understand, right? He can't just say, yeah, they're uncircumcised, and I know you guys hate each other, but you got to make up and kiss and, you know, and be buddy-buddy again. No, he, he, he has to explain it better than that. And so what Paul does here is he tells him, he says, listen, what did our father find according to that circumcision? He didn't find anything. Because remember, the whole, how many times do you hear Paul saying in the scriptures, the circumcision referring to the uncircumcision, right? It was the high-minded Jews, the snot-nosed Jews, who walked around like they were something special, and they looked down upon their brethren because they were uncircumcised. And so here's Paul, and he's telling him, listen, our father Abraham didn't find anything according to circumcision. He didn't gain anything according to circumcision. It was by faith, right? It was his faith, okay? He said, for if it was by works, he would have something to boast about, right? And that work, folks, is the work of circumcision. It's the work of the law. What did Jesus say? He said, he will come and judge each man according to his works. By the way, that was going to take place in the first century, so it doesn't have anything to do with anybody today, therefore even further confirming I.O. But what did Jesus say? He said he's coming to judge each man according to his works. Well, folks, simple stuff here, simple concept. 
In order to be judged, one would need a law. Okay, that's just as simple as it gets. You cannot judge somebody by a general moral heart law because we all have different societies, different cultures. We're all brought up differently, right? Nobody's the same, okay? So you can't judge somebody by a moral heart law. Well, if you say, oh, what about the Ten Commandments? Uh, Okay, who's keeping the Sabbath holy? Right? You, You run into so many different problems. So Jesus saying that he was coming to judge each man according to his works clearly involves those who are under the law. They were being judged according to the law, according to their works under the law. And guess what, folks? This is no surprise because if Chicken Shit Shitterly understood and knew his Old Testament the way he should, being such a brilliant scholar as he proclaims, he would understand that this is exactly what was told from the start. This is not a surprise. Moses, Joshua, the whole gang, they all told the Israelites that they needed to be very, very careful. Why? Well, because they had the law, and if they weren't careful to observe every point in it, they were screwed. They were screwed. So when Jesus comes along and says they would be judged each man according to his works, he's not talking universally, obviously. He's talking contextually about the works done under the law. Okay? So... We have to be careful and we have to understand that this is actually fulfilling something. It's not just, you know, let's just decide what it means and call it general works of the flesh like this bozo assumes. It's actually fulfilling something greater and something more contextual. Go read Deuteronomy and pick up how many times Moses talks about the law being a curse and take notice how that connects so beautifully with what we see taking place in the New Testament. So, but, but here's Romans 2, back, back to action here. He says to the Jews, now remember, he's talking to both. He's breaking down the rift that was between them. He calls it the enmity, which was the law. That's the whole thing. Ephesians, Paul tells them that the enmity between the two parties was the law. Okay, now imagine arguing that Egyptians and Assyrians were angry about Israel's law, and that's the enmity that... Paul is breaking down. That's stupid, right? That doesn't make any sense. What makes more sense is that this is the two sticks of Ezekiel. This is the two houses of Israel being brought together, creating one new man, breaking down the enmity that was between them, which was the law, which we know from history is is accurate. There was a lot of enmity because the kingdom split. There was division and enmity over where they should worship, yada, yada, yada. It was all about the law, okay? So Paul says this, Indeed, you are called a Jew and rest on the law and make your boast in God and know his will and approve things are excellent and and you're instructed by the law, blah, blah, blah. Okay, you're a light to the blind. Then he goes on, he says, you know, you're basically a hypocrite. God is blasphemed among the nations because of you. But look what he says in verse 25. He says, for circumcision is indeed profitable if you keep the law. But if you are a breaker of the law, your circumcision has become, become uncircumcision. Right? So Paul, again, goes back to the circumcision argument, which is a common theme throughout all of his letters. Right? He's talking about circumcision. Why? Because the Jews clung to that circumcision like you wouldn't believe. That was their token. That was their ticket. But Paul, of course, gathering in the children of Israel, both Jew and Gentile, both circumcised and uncircumcised, is trying his best to explain that it's actually about faith and that the promise was made to their father about through faith, not the law, not through circumcision, not through the works of the law, but through faith. So that's Romans chapter 2. Now remember, we're getting closer to Romans 4.1 and there's no chapter breaks. But notice that Paul is talking specifically about circumcision because that's what the Jews were using to justify their, you know, objections to these ones being included, to these elect Gentiles being included. He goes on in chapter three, he says, what advantage then has the Jew? Blah, blah, blah. Goes on, for if the, if the truth of God has increased through my life to his glory, why am I also still judged as a sinner? Blah, blah, blah. I'm just scrolling through this here to give you the gist. 
What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged that both Jews and Greeks, they're all under sin. Now notice Jews and Greeks are all under sin. And then he goes on, he says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. They have all turned aside. Okay, blah, blah, blah. Now, folks, again, Shitterly doesn't understand his Bible or he doesn't have the knowledge to bang with the big boys. Because if you know what Paul is quoting here, he's quoting Old Testament passages all about Israel. These passages that talk about their throats turning aside, their being graves, their their backbiters, their you know their tongues are full of deceit, destruction and misery are in their ways, the way of peace they don't know, there's no fear of God before their eyes. This is passages about Israel in the Old Testament when they turned against their God. This is a quote from the Old Testament all about Israel. It's not about Joe Blow Pagan. This is about Israel. So what is God, what is Paul doing quoting that when he's asking about these, these people? Remember, we have to keep this in the context of Romans 1. He introduces the characters in view in Romans 1 as a group of individuals who, although they knew God, they didn't glorify him. Although they had the manifestation of God, they didn't glorify him. Although they knew the righteous judgments of God, they didn't glorify him. So why are we changing the characters when we get to Romans 3, Romans 4? Why can we not keep this in check based on what we know and who we know these are? It's a common mistake. And people like Shitterly think they're actually proving something. Okay, look what he says in verse 19. Now we know whatever the law says, is that law again. What law? The general law in the heart? No, no, the only law. He says, it says to those who are under the law that all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Right? The snake guy. Oh my God. What did Paul just say? Therefore, by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For the law is the knowledge of sin. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. So folks... God, that hurts. That really hurts Shitterly's argument. Therefore, by the works of the law. All right, here's Paul. Just a few passages before Romans 4.1, talking about the works of the law. And here's Shitterly in Romans 4.1, arguing with me that this is not about the works of the law. This is not about circumcision, folks. This is about the general works of the flesh. All right, Shitterly knows better than Paul. But here's Paul in Romans 3, verse 20, saying, Therefore, by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. That is precisely what he says in Romans 4, 1. Right? Think about it. What did our father Abraham find according to the flesh? Right? Let me go, let me go read it again because I, I don't want to miss out on this. This is very important. What then shall we say that our father Abraham has, find, has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about. Justified by works. Folks, Shitterly argues that this is general works of the flesh. My argument is that Paul's talking about works of the law. Let's jump back one chapter to Romans 3 and let's catch this in its flowing context. Romans 3, verse 20. I'm sorry, Romans 3, verse... Uh, Oh, where am I? Nope, that's Romans 4. Let me go back. Remember, Shitterly says that it's about works of the general flesh. But Paul in Romans 20 smacks Shitterly into UK oblivion and says, therefore, by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. So folks, who's correct? I'm correct. Works of the law is what Paul is talking about in Romans 4, 1. Very, very clearly. Okay. And then look at this. Look at this. Just a couple verses prior in Romans 3, verse 27, at the very end of Romans chapter 3, just before we turn the page and see Romans chapter 4, verse 1, where Shitterly claims it's about general works of the flesh. Look what Paul says. He says in verse 27, where is the boasting? Right? Where is the boasting? Now remember, Romans 4, verse 1 is talking about Abraham boasting in the works of the flesh right? If he's boasting in his works, right? But look at what Paul says. Where is the boasting? 
is it excluded? By what law? Right? By what law? This is getting ugly for shitterly here. Of works? No. But by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Apart from the works of the law. Now remember, two verses later, Paul's going to ask, what did our father Abraham find according to the flesh? According to the law. He found nothing. Right? Because Paul's whole point is that if he did find something, then he would have something to boast about. Right? He would, he would be able to boast in that. But here's Paul, just a couple verses prior, and he's saying very clearly, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. And he goes on, he says, Or is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, the Gentiles also since there is one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith, do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. Very next passage, what then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the law? You see how that works? For if Abraham was justified by works of the law, he has something to boast about, but not before God. Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work and believes, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Then he goes on in verse 9, he says, Does this blessedness then come upon the circumcised only? See how Paul's whole focus throughout this whole first four chapters of Romans is on the law, and on the works of the law, and on circumcision? And do you see how Shitterly has to force feed that concept of general works of the flesh down your throat in order to avoid this? Shitterly doesn't have a clue what he's talking about. Paul's entire focus in Romans 1, 2, 3, and 4 is all about faith versus works of the law. That's it. Not faith versus general works of the flesh, of the meat suit. No. Faith versus works of their law. He's breaking down the enmity, which was the law. He's telling the descendants of Israel that their father, Abraham, found favor with their God prior to his circumcision through his faith. And remember, just a couple verses later, Paul's going to say the promise wasn't to Abraham and to his seed through the law, but it was to Abraham and to his seed through the righteousness of faith. I'll rephrase that so you understand it a little bit better. The promise wasn't to Abraham and to his descendants Israel through the law, but it was to Abraham and his descendants Israel through faith. Because remember, the promise came through Isaac. Who came through Isaac? Jacob. Who came from Jacob? The 12 tribes of Israel. So shall your descendants be, ladies and gents. And of course, we know this fits with everything else Paul said, like Galatians when he gives the analogy of the free woman versus the bond woman. That whole analogy is faith versus the law. That's the whole analogy. Not faith versus general works of the flesh, like chicken shit Shaolin would have you believe. Faith versus the law. Can't be any clearer, folks. Folks, I hope you enjoyed this one. I hope it made a lot of sense. Romans is all about Israel. Paul's entire discourse in Romans chapter 1 explains very clearly and doesn't allow us to sh uh, stray off in different ideas and speculation. He keeps it tight. He tells you who the group is that's in focus, the, who the group is that is unrighteous. He's, he's, he's explaining Israel's history in a nutshell. The same thing Stephen does in Acts 7, use the exact same words, exact same descriptions. In order for chicken shit, Shaolin, Chitterly to be correct, everything in the Old Testament would need to be thrown out, disregarded, blacked out, ripped out. You'd have to start saying that pagans knew God. Pagans knew the judgments of God. Pagans had relationship with God. God manifested himself to pagans. But of course, we know none of that is true. We know quite the opposite is true. So folks, what did our father Abraham find according to his circumcision is Paul's question. Plain and simple. Because he's beating down the point that the works of the law will not justify them. It's their faith. It's their faith. Okay? Very simply. But it's contextual faith. Okay? It's contextual faith. 
so shall your descendants be. I hope you enjoyed it, everybody. If you did, give it a like, a ruski. Daniel Chicken Shit Shaolin. Tell your wifey to give me a call. Uh, and uh, we'll catch everybody on that flip side. I hope you all have a great day and a great weekend. And we'll see you soon. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.